Here's a picture of a scene out of the movie Gladiator. Obviously, the guy in the middle, he is uh, the commander of the troops, right? He's on horseback. But I want you to look at the set of troops on each side of him. The one on the left, they're going to be called legionnaires. And the easy way to tell them apart is their shield. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. The people on the right, they're holding arrows and bows and things like that. These guys are going to be called the auxiliaries, and so we're going to talk about them as well. So we have talked about the Greek hoplites before. There's a picture of a Greek hoplite. Now we're moving to the legionnaire. They're not completely unrelated. In fact, the Romans saw uh, Greek fighting techniques. They took a lot of their fighting techniques and adapted them. So I want you to, to focus in on their shield. One way that the legionnaire's shield is different is that it's longer and it's rounded. So that a legionnaire can actually fight in groups or fight alone. Where a hoplite really was only effective if they're fighting in groups side by side to form that wall. Uh, so that their sides would be protected. But now the legionnaire doesn't need that. You notice that they're both holding a spear. However, their spears were used for different things. A uh, Greek hoplite, that was a thrusting spear. Uh, they would never throw that. They would always hold on to that and just um, basically poke at the enemy. The legionnaire would actually throw um, his javelin, which is called a pilum, and then their main weapon would become the sword that he's, he's got on his belt there. Some differences in their armor. The Greek hoplite's armor was normally uh, bronze or leather. Um, the legionnaire's armor is, is updated and a little better. Okay, so if you're going to become a, a legionnaire, you had to be a Roman citizen. If you're not a Roman citizen, you'd, you'd join the auxiliary, and we'll, we'll learn about that in a minute. Depending on the time period that, that we're talking about, uh, they weren't allowed to live with their families, um, so they, they didn't take their families with them to battle. And some of the time, that they weren't even allowed to be married, because they didn't want that to be a distraction. Their shield gives them excellent protection, and I and it's also a weapon so it's, it's rounded to protect their sides like we talked about it's covering them from chin to shin but it's also a weapon if you look at that metal ball right in the center that was actually to attack and and to to break arms or or, or attack the enemy there and then again their sword would be their main weapon so let's talk about what they did with the pilum they would actually throw their pilum once the enemy got close enough to hit him with it. They're doing that for two reasons. One is they want to kill him, right? They can actually kill somebody with the pilum or, or wound them, injure them. Uh, the other thing is they want them to separate. Because if they can separate and divide them, they're easier to, to defeat. But in order to do that, you have to be very disciplined. Because you have to wait for the enemy to be close enough to you that you can hit them, but not too close that you can't have enough time to draw your sword. So they all have to throw it basically at the same time. And so you can imagine if one guy's throwing a pilum, that's not going to do much damage. But if everyone throws their pilum all at the same time, um, that would help. That would do something. Now these guys would <clears throat> would march about 15 miles a day. Uh, what's What's difficult about that isn't walking 15 miles a day is that they actually carried all their gear which weighed up to 60 to 80 pounds so this is a huge pack that they're weighing and it's not like those comfortable backpacking uh, packs that you can buy at at the store today where the weight is evenly distributed and and all that you can see on this guy one shoulder is getting the the brunt of of the weight um, this would have been really uncomfortable you would have to be really tough to do this um, I remember watching a, a documentary um, on PBS where they, they turned American soldiers into Legionnaire soldiers. And American soldiers are really used to packing, right, uh, marching. But they had a really difficult time marching in this way because it's just so unusual to them. Okay, let's talk about who's in charge of these Legionnaires, kind of a little bit of the organization. 
Here's a picture of a centurion. The first thing they probably notice is his bizarre hat, right? So what's the point of having a bizarre hat like that? It's not to look cool, necessarily. That might make you look cool, I don't know. Uh, but notice how high it is. If you're, if you're in battle, you're supposed to stay as a group, right? And you need to know where your leader is, and that let them know who it is. It also shows rank. Here's another example of what a hat may have looked like. Do you notice the, the rings on his chest there? Um, those were actually collars that were worn by the Gauls. And so this legionnaire probably fought against the Gaul, or, or sorry, not this legionnaire, the centurion probably fought against the Gauls. And so those are basically medals for him that they took off these soldiers from Gaul. You also notice that he's carrying this big stick, right? Well, what's that for? That's not for the enemy. That's for his soldiers. And if you got out of line, he could actually punish you with that vine stick. You also wouldn't really see a centurion marching around. They would ride on horseback, unlike the legionnaire. So, so life is much better. Even where they slept at night was much, much better than where the legionnaires spent the night. Okay, now let's talk about auxiliaries. You're probably not unfamiliar with the word auxiliary. Um, on your television, you might have auxiliary channels where it says AUX in the top corner. Um, high schools have auxiliary gyms. Well, what does auxiliary mean? Auxiliary literally means extras. So if these guys are the extras, you have to remember that the main soldiers are legionnaires. Okay, So anything that isn't a legionnaire is an auxiliary. And normally these were non-Roman citizens. They're basically recruited from conquered tribes. Uh, the carrot that they use to get them to join is that after 25 years, they can actually gain citizenship for themselves and for their family. Now, 25 years sounds like a long time, and it is. Uh, but basically, they're doing it for themselves, but also for their family. So, so it's really important for them and those that they love to become a citizen. Now what's interesting is you can't say that an auxiliary looks like a certain thing. So these are two examples of auxiliaries as well. Um, basically what Rome would do is they'd, they'd find out what you did well if you were a fighter and they'd just use that in battle. You, you may have heard your parents or, or someone tell you to keep your standards high so what does that even mean, to keep your standards high? Um, that saying comes back to these guys right here. These guys are called standard bearers. You can obviously see the bears. Um, but what they're holding, the flag and, and like the rings, uh, those are called standards. And they had to hold their standards high so that people that were fighting under their standard knew where they were supposed to be in battle so they wouldn't get lost in the, in the chaos. So when you're, when you're told, keep your standards high, that just basically means know where you're supposed to be and be there, right? We talked about in, in Greece how they used a double reed flute to, to give orders, to give instructions in, in battle. During the American Revolution, uh, they used the drummer boy. In Rome, they actually used a horn. And so this would be the guy that would, would basically... Uh, play orders to the troops so they could hear them. Now there there was a law that said that you could not bring your troops into Rome. Well, if you can't bring your army into Rome, who's taking care of the people inside of Rome? Who's taking care of the consuls, the senators, all those other guys? Well, they basically have their own police force inside of Rome, and they're called the Praetorian Guards. These guys are also the equivalent of the Secret Service. So here I have a picture of President Bush. Um, I couldn't find one of Obama yet. But notice all these guys around him. They're, they're not necessarily his buddies. They are his guards. Okay. Um, what's interesting is, recently they made this thriller movie where one of the Secret Service men actually turned on the president and tried to kill him. 
Now, if you think about that, it wouldn't be hard for one of these guys right next to the president to just pull out their gun and shoot him, right? Uh, they're armed and they're right next to him. And so, ironically, although the emperor's guards, the Praetorian guards, are there obviously to protect the emperor, they are responsible for killing them later on because people bribe them um, and, and they're, they, they have an incentive to do that. One way that the emperor actually tried to prevent this is that he, he paid his legionnaire soldiers three times or sorry, he, he paid his Praetorian guards three times as much as the legionnaire soldiers trying to make their life so good that they would never want to get rid of the emperor. But that wasn't always the case. So the question is, why is the military so good? One is they are extremely organized. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, you're going to hear the word century a lot. In a century, it would be logical that that's made up of a hundred soldiers, right? Because there's a hundred years in a century. That's actually wrong. There's 80 legionnaire soldiers in a century. Then they're also organized in, in what's called legions, and you'll hear legions a lot. Legions are roughly about 5,000 men. So that'll help you when we talk in class about Julius Caesar and Sola and, and, and some other people, because I won't necessarily tell you the number of soldiers, but I might tell you the number of legions that they had. So you just take the, the number of legions times 5,000 to find out the legionnaire soldiers. They were also trained to fight in groups and to fight individually, which, um, which is exceptional uh, for the time. One, th one way that they, they did this is they took war strategies and weapons from those that they conquered. A great example of this is when the Romans took over um, Sicily or, and the, the town Syracuse on Sicily. There was a guy living there named Archimedes, and Archimedes had invented powerful catapults. And so basically they, they kill Archimedes, but then they take the catapult and make thousands of them. Okay? Romans are now known for catapults where they didn't invent it, they just took it from an enemy. They also develop all these roads. Um, they develop concrete, which allows them to, to create all these network of roads. Uh, Roman roads are, are famous for even being used today. Some, some roads have survived all these years and they're actually used today. But if you look at a map of, of Roman roads, it's just a spider web of roads going everywhere. And its original purpose was actually to move soldiers from one side of the empire to the next. It had other um, kind of side effects as well, where it, Christianity missionaries actually move along those roads as well. Uh, trade moves along those roads. Um, and it's used for other reasons, but that was its original purpose. Besides constant fighting and training, there were other keys to the success of this young army. The genius of the Roman war machine was rarely the invention of new weapons or tactics. Rather, just as they would in art and technology, Romans stole the military innovations of others brilliantly. From the Greeks, Romans took most of their early weapons and armor, like traditional round shields and hoplite thrusting spears. From the Gauls, a long javelin called a pilum, which they could throw a hundred feet, along with larger oblong shields and chainmail armor. And from the nearby Etruscans, Rome copied the basic organization of her military the legions of roughly 5,000 men each. The Romans knew how to find an edge anywhere they could. The Roman army, with few exceptions, was always well-fed and healthy. Now, in an age of muscle-powered armies where physical strength determines your dominance over an enemy, being healthy and being rested and well-fed would be today like having a weapons overmatched against an enemy in a firepower battle. It was very important. Another secret to Rome's success was extreme, unflinching discipline. Every Roman soldier knew retreat was never an option. 
It was a policy that often made the difference between victory and defeat. In the eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball combat of the ancient world, retreat was almost always the wrong move. Two men armed with swords and shields find it surprisingly difficult to seriously wound or kill each other. Until, that is, one of them turns and runs. It's far easier to stab an enemy's unprotected back and sides. And so, the bloodiest slaughters occurred when an army panicked, turned their backs, and ran. Thanks to their unwavering discipline, the great Roman legions just didn't panic. 